I'm going to say it now, and I'm going to try to reinforce it during the presentation. But the key concept that we believe in is that AI shouldn't just be something that happens at Stanford, MIT, or the universities or places that have the resources, but that it's actually something accessible for everybody that has the motivation and the grit to learn through it, right? Because if there is one thing that AI has is that it's hard because it's a combination of several sciences at the same time. Um, so this is also why we have the format of the bootcamp, which is 10 weeks um, every single day, eight hours, well, nine hours a day plus um, extra time if they want to stay. And then um, it all comes together into uh, today where uh, they actually are going to demo the projects and you're going to see them for 10 minutes. And I told them it's going to be unfair because that's the, the judgment that you're going to get of them. But it's also how it works in real life, right? If you pitch a project and they don't get a good impression, then you fail and you have to try again. So the basic idea is that um, through this, uh, we're able to accelerate them into their area knowledge. Um, most of the build that you're going to see today um, actually didn't code before or had very little background of coding. Some of them were engineers. Some of them came from a completely um, different field. So um, if you're a developer, be mindful of that because definitely um, a demo is an MVP. It's not an end-to-end, uh, let's say, AI product. And if we were able to do so, we would be charging a lot of money for, for consulting, right? So uh, you can send us your, your requests. Um, if you like the projects, then they're good enough. And, and now I'm going to move on with basically a bit of an introduction that I wanted to cover on, on AI, right? And the first thing that it matters for us or that I can share with you of why we decided to start this is because personally, at least for me, um, when I was working in the, as a, doing consulting, actually, in, in the automotive field, I kind of realized that AI was, was going to take over, right? And it was not necessarily in one industry, which was automotive because of self-driving cars, but it was something that was like a global phenomenon. And the reason behind this is that artificial intelligence, um, at its worst, what it can do, given a lot of data, is to replicate the behavior that humans do, right? And as humans, what we do has value. Think about a taxi driver, right? You can charge a price for it. So if you're able to have an algorithm that does the same thing of the taxi driver, or better, like Uber, then um, you can sort of substitute the money that the human taxi drivers are getting for algorithms or a system that just processes that and gets 25% of the payment each time, right? And one of the interesting and more scary things is that once you invent this, this can be available to the whole world in two or three days, right? Um, so definitely, I think that this is super exciting if you're working in the field. And it also feels scary because you're thinking about the taxi drivers, you're thinking about the people that are cashiers at the supermarket, you're thinking about all these jobs that are manual, repeatable, and are scalable uh, and are replaceable. And um, it kind of feels like there's going to be a moment where we're going to be able to take so many jobs very fast because we can replace them. But actually, <coughs> replacing a job, like getting a new job, is not that fast. You know, you have to retrain yourself, you have to find your field, you have to find your passion. And while there are a lot of like hopeful pitches of like, hey, it's the fourth industrial revolution, we figured it out the previous three industrial revolutions, um, something that we're very critical about is the idea that the notion that, let's say, in the previous industrial revolution, what got replaced were horses by cars. There were a million of horses that were left um, on the fields just without a purpose. And then suddenly the cars came over and then we had a lot of horse meat. And the biggest question that we have to ask ourselves for now is if we are the cars or we are the horses, right? Uh, what, what's AI replacing and who, what is our role in, in that future, right? And I don't want to get super scary in there, but what I want to pitch you is that what, what we feel that we can do is to contribute to accelerate knowledge of a diverse set of people into the field um, that can bring their own perspective to create more robust ideas, right? And hopefully uh, you're going to see this reinforced through the talk, and I'm also going to cover um, some of the topics or things that we do in the bootcamp in case you're interested, as well as some ethical principles that we have incorporated. Um, also, another thing that happens um, with education itself is that traditional education, if you think about it, it's broken, right? Um, so there is high barrier to entry. If I wanted to start a university right now, I'd have to do a campus, like the one that's built on UPC that you can see from over there. They're actually in depth because of building that campus. So they're now sacrificing the quality that they deliver to their students because um, they have to sort of be profitable um, for the government not to go bankrupt. And the idea behind this as well is that um, there was a new trend that resurfaced, um, which was online courses, right? You probably tried um, some of them. 
and they're super useful. You have the world's best knowledge available at your reach, but I think they still have one key problem, which is that they don't tap onto you. They don't tap onto your needs. When you're doing an online course, and I know probably I'm, I'm excluding from experience, you are super hopeful of starting it. Like, of course, I'm gonna do this course. I'm just gonna sign up, I'm gonna pay 100 euros. This course is from Harvard. And then as the course starts getting harder and harder and harder, you sort of, it's not that you give up, but your real life takes over, right? Like you have this course that's somewhere in the internet, and then you have your friend that wants to go for beers, and then you have this uh, thing that you have to do for work that you have to deliver. And at the end, you end up leaving these things behind, right? And if, if you think that this is only you, 94% uh, of online courses are not complete. Right, on average. So um, I think that we still have a fundamental problem with online education, which is that we're not figuring the right ways to engage us. Um, right? So the idea um, of creating this bootcamp was able was, was to deliver the best education, um, let's say, on specific locations, just moving independently without needing a huge lot of resources. Like, for example, here we're using very beautiful space, but we're just paying for a small room. I think that that's um, scalable. And um, with the idea that people that are interested all across the world um, can come over. And for people that don't, we actually um, launch scholarships, let's say, uh, for example, to facilitate the access of, of women into artificial intelligence. So um, another thing is, um, again, I want to um, sell you on the idea or convince you on the idea that AI is not just a hype. Um, these things are increasing um, exponentially. and. The way you can think about it is that it's increasing exponentially because the data that we're able to gather about our own human behavior is also increasing exponentially, right? And then basically we get to a point where um, AI, the, 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 the whole premise of deep learning is that traditional algorithms, the more data you fed them, there was a moment there they would stop. Like sort of, if you've ever seen a logarithm, like how you do a log scale, uh, sorry, a log, it sort of plummets and it stops in one, one point and it goes to infinity but super slow, right? And uh, the idea with deep learning is that there's a, it's actually the opposite. That there's, it's, it's, it's super bad, bad, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Like you can't distinguish between um, a man and a woman and then suddenly it gets enough data and then it does everything to 99% accuracy, right? Um, so that's the whole premise and then there's a variety of fields um, that are working for AI. And as well for education, there's this new trend, I would say there's two new trends. The first one is coding boot camps that have surfaced um, all over the world because basically, our premise is that you don't necessarily care about the title that you get on your LinkedIn, but that you care about the next job that you land. So we're 100% geared towards getting you to the point where you want to be. If you want to recycle your professional career, if you want to um, transition from one field to another. And um, with the idea as well of um, something that we're eager to implement that we haven't done yet here in Spain, but the income share agreements, right? And I think this is actually the future, which is that you basically align the incentives of your students with the, the value that you get from the bootcamp. So like right now, um, uh, this is not, uh, so we're a young bootcamp, so we have to test this with like an entity that's accredited. But the premise of an income sharing agreement is that you could come and pay zero euros upfront, and then later on, um, you can basically pay a part of your salary, right? And this is not a new um, uh, solution. It was something proposed by a Nobel Prize back in the 1950s, and it was sort of like hidden there until someone rediscovered it in 2012. Um, but um, while we still don't have the, the capacity eh, to provide the cash flow to just fund everybody to come into the bootcamp, it's something that's super appealing because it basically says, if the education that we deliver to you is bad, then you shouldn't pay for it, right? Or if you don't benefit from the experience, if you were a baker, if you were baking bread before the bootcamp, and after the bootcamp you end up baking bread, the whole premise of the bootcamp, which is that we could get you a better job, does not exist. So therefore, you shouldn't pay, right? Um, so that's something that we're not, again, we're not ready to implement yet, but we're, we're working on experiments, we're testing, um, because basically you have to get uh, approved for a credit and so on, and you have to figure out the cash flow. Um, also, um, some of the, uh, to give you some ideas on what are the two roadblocks that are happening right now on artificial intelligence. Um, so the first one is obviously the computing power, uh, because as AI models want to become more accurate, what uh, Google and Facebook and Microsoft engineers do is they just get more computers because they can. But you're going to see that the true limitation is that nowadays if you're a person trying to beat someone in a model, then it's a moment that you don't have a better computer. You just have what you have. Or you can pay extra money on the cloud, but it gets super expensive. And the other limitation is actually the people, right? So um, this, I love it. It's, it's an article that came out recently from DeepMind. Um, if you know, it's a company that was purchased by Google. 
Alphabet, the company uh, founder of Google, and they spend 570 million in salaries, which means that they're paying 690K for every employee. So that people that are working and that, uh, I don't know if you know Uriol Vinyals, who works at DeepMind, is, is from here. We hope to have him on, on this winter um, somewhere on that work, right? So it's, it's incredible how much the other companies are paying to try to steal those salaries, right? Because that's the price in which they're not willing to do. <coughs> and then, well, actually, um, the reason why we're setting all of this is to um, solve the second problem, which is to enable for more people to join a education um, faster at a better pace, right? And the idea of how we do it here, um, it's very learned by doing. So uh, the premise of the bootcamp is that we teach a class in the morning for two hours, and then for the next six hours, you have to figure out the solution to the exercises yourself. So um, it basically, the, the whole idea is, I think, the opposite of a business school, where they go and they deliver your master class, and they say, when you encounter this problem, you'll figure it out because you will apply this framework. Well, we know, if you've ever coded in your life, that it's not the same. Even if there's a tutorial online that tells you how to implement a Docker, when you do it on your computer, something is going to break. So what we get everybody is through the experience of failing and failing and failing, six hours a day, um, every day. Uh, for 10 weeks, right? Uh, the idea as well is that we match uh, people in pairs so that they are sort of mixing the levels. So there's, a, there's an average of the level. If you're very senior um, and you're mentoring someone that's very junior, you're benefiting from teaching again because you're actually learning through having to explain that in the most simple terms. And if you are a person that is very junior, if a teacher that knows everything comes to you and tells you the solution, you don't learn anything. If you got someone that has figured out in the same path that you have, it's much more intuitive. Um, so that's what we do. And another thing that the fellows uh, sometimes have complained, like Jan, I have to come this Saturday. Um, I don't force anybody to stay um, extra time. Um, but I, I, I really believe that if you haven't figured something out, you should just spend the extra time to figure it out and then come tomorrow, right? Because the whole thing is that you have one day, and then the next day is built on the previous day, and then the next day is built on the previous day. So if you have a, a, a block, a hole on your, on your house, and on the foundation of your house, and the house crumbles, right? So the idea is that because the pace of the bootcamp doesn't stop, then you shouldn't stop learning either. And um, for, uh, to, to pitch you on the, on the dream that we have as, a, as an academy itself, we don't want to just become uh, a coding bootcamp. We actually aim to be um, an AI hub. We want to foster research. We want to foster um, education. We want to foster companies. So that's why we're super eager to work together um, with, with you guys, if you're working for a company, on just basically creating an ecosystem, right? Um, to get these people going. And the reason for this is because if you can get fellows to already start working on real projects from the start, it's much more exciting for them. It's much more exciting from the company because the cost to experiment is lower. And also, I think there's, there's something that it's constantly overlooked, that is that in AI, academia is really driving the innovation, but it's not really reaping the rewards. The, the price that academia pays for doing the best papers is getting their researchers stolen by Facebook and DeepMind, so there's no contribution. So this is also why um, we lead other groups like Barcelona.ai and AI Saturdays, which is a nonprofit to get people to learn AI um, every Saturday. But we're really keen on fostering just an ecosystem. And in our case, if you ask me, it's about the AI ecosystem of Barcelona, because I think we do deserve um, to be an AI hub. Uh, we have the talent, we have a beautiful weather, a beautiful beach, um, uh, and then the salaries, in a good way for the companies are quite low in terms that they, are, they can afford to relocate people here. And the idea is that there are cities like Montreal that were not a tech hub before, and they just had um, leading universities like McGill, leading people like uh, Jan LeCun, Joshua Bengio, and Geoffrey Hinton, which actually in Toronto, but they were able to establish an AI hub there. Um, so the idea is that we want to do the same concept um, here, right? And uh, well, uh, that's my familiar face, which is me. Um, but on the back line, there's also Miguel on the stream, which has three daughters in Tarragona. So it was quite hard for, for him to come, but I'm sure that he's uh, available. And Stefan Saldi had to take care of, of some, some personal issues. So he's away. And Eden is also watching on streaming on Cornell University. Uh, actually, to pitch you, uh, she was one the first success case that we created out of AI Saturdays, which was the first initiative that we began. And uh, she got a fellowship uh, to do the, her AI master's in Cornell University, um, which is one of the best um, universities in, in the United States. And then um, uh, we also have a lot of stories from fellows that have already been impacted um, by our bootcamp. But this is the first time that we do the batch from Academy. So I think that you, you're better seeing it offline um, with the demonstrations and what they show you. 
because this is a project that they have built in the last two weeks, right? So it's not the seven weeks, the first seven weeks they were learning, um, actually the first eight weeks they were learning, and then the last two um, they were working on this project. Um, so give them some mercy, but I think that honestly, you're gonna be impressed. And um, I wanna go beyond um, perhaps another thing that we really care about artificial intelligence is actually the ethics, right? Um, so one of the trends uh, in AI is just to use AI to achieve whatever, and we don't believe that that is the way. Um, I don't know if you've been to China, but I was there over a year ago, and if you happen to catch a bullet train between, uh, let's say, Hangzhou and Shanghai, there is actually um, a nice little gentle warning that tells you that if you don't behave in the train, you will get your social credit points removed. Um, and if you get those social credit points removed, then you don't happen to be able to fly in first class, you cannot ride the train, you are not approved for loans, and so on and so forth. So that's AI, but it's not applied, applied for an ethical, um, relevant case. So we want to work for the scenarios in which AI sort of improves the status of our society and is focused on, on making a positive impact. And if I have to summarize all of this in one thing, um, it's nothing new. We already know this for doctors, right? Um, it's the Hippocratic Oath. Um, it, it, it's basically, it was a code that was invented by the Greeks to make doctors be responsible for the human lives that they were handling because one doctor could have a huge impact on one human life. The way you can understand this with AI is that one human, a developer, can have a very huge impact, little impact, on a lot of lives at the same time by deploying a solution that's scalable for, let's say, the whole population of China. So we really see this uh, as a way to um, push forward an, an, ethical, uh, an ethical way of behavior. So all the engineers that graduate from our bootcamp uh, have to sign this, this pledge, and we hope to hold them to those, to those standards. Um, and also to pitch you on, on, the, on the name, in case you haven't noticed, um, Academy is the, the original name with a K uh, of the Greek Academy that Plato founded. And I really, really believe on, on the principles on which that was laid off with the essence that it's a place where literally the best people can come to learn, um, no matter sort of um, their background, gender. Actually, um, there's a very interesting story how there was a woman that they didn't first allow a woman into the Greek Academy of Plato that enlisted as a man and then uh, uh, learned or became a, a very famous philosopher, right? Um, so out of the Academy of Plato, um, it's perhaps one of the biggest, um, uh, let's say, uh, gifts that we got from Plato because not only do we got his philosophy, which was great, but we got a new set of um, disciples that were even uh, some people could argue better than original Plato uh, itself. So that's um, that's our goal: gather a set of high-performing people together in an intense environment for ten weeks, or the part-time bootcamp that we're launching for those of you that are working, um, and then just um, see how you guys, uh, the girls, achieve um, amazing results. Um, and then also to pitch you on on this, uh, we do not necessarily it's the first bootcamp, but we do have some experience. Uh, I personally launch um, AI Saturdays, which is a community that is available uh, all over the world in over 150 cities now. And what we do is you learn AI um, every Saturday, right? So for 15 Saturdays in a row, it's for people that already know how to code and you only do it for four hours. But if you're not fully sure and you want to test the waters, it's something that is out there. And the, the fundamental goal here is for, to, for us to have a community in Lagos, Nigeria, which is one of the strongest hubs, a community in India, in Kerala, and a community basically in everywhere you need. Because if you have this, you are able to allow people in developing countries to basically use AI to skip and leapfrog one technology forward, right? The way you could think about it is, is um, um, how China is skipping credit cards, right? They, went, they had no credit card system, their banking system was bad, and now if you go to China, you pay directly with your phone and now with your face, which is a bit sketchy, right? But, but that's, um, that's the way. And then for the bootcamp itself, um, what I can tell you in case you haven't seen it, I'm gonna skip this because I've already covered, but um, it's basically 10 weeks and it's super intense. And what we do is basically uh, you have a pre-course in which you have to learn Python and we set some tests and some challenges um, and you have to complete them in order to be admitted to the bootcamp. Um, if you don't have a math or an engineering background, we also give you some, some details or some, some primers on statistics, which is actually a fundamental core of how AI comes together. And then we cover um, basically a review of Python, a very accelerated review. Um, we do the data science libraries that are needed from Python, the implementations for machine learning, uh, deep learning, and then we apply models of experts that we bring that are changing on, on each session, right? So um, from uh, 
computer vision, autonomous driving, and health. Um, and then at the very end, we get them a week of deploying systems at scale, which we could not deliver on the boot on the bootcamp for for this edition because we had uh, the expert that we had booked canceled. And yet, you're going to be impressed that some fellows still managed to implement like fully end-to-end -end pipelines. And, and then they do the project, which is basically the culmination of all their work, with the idea that they're already focusing their projects in their field that they want to work in or in their passions. And I think that you're really going to see this um, through basically the motivation of the fellows today. <coughs> so this is a bit more of, of what we cover, in case you're curious, but you can check um, all of that out in the website. So I'm going to skip it forward for the sake of um, starting on time, which it's something that I'm keen on and we couldn't fulfill uh, to do those requirements. But <coughs> I'll give you a pitch um, up to the, well, the final thing, of course, is that you, we hope that you get hired from an awesome company and we can put your, your company name um, up there. And uh, the fundamental idea is that uh, we want you to experience this, but we cannot tell you how it, how it is, right? It's like, it doesn't matter how many words I say, um, you're still um, you're still going to be curious or you're still going to have doubts. So hopefully today through the demos, you're going to get to see uh, um, a brisk of what these people can, can accomplish. Um, and I don't know if you have any questions uh, for the moment. You can do a short pause because for the demos, there's not going to be questions. We're going to push them all at the end for the networking because there's ham, there's, there's potatoes, there's beer. So I think they're, they're going to go more, more smoothly. Um, so I don't know if there's Anything that you guys want me to answer? <coughs> I'm gonna assume no. Um, and if there's any on YouTube, we'll, we'll answer that. Um, so before the demos, um, I'm gonna go with my own demo, which is um, a summary of what I've learned um, in the past year. Because um, the interesting thing, and maybe you, you are seeing me now, and whatever, I'm speaking about AI, and you're like, okay, this, this person knows about deep learning, um, I, I didn't know any of this about a year and a half ago, probably a year and nine months. Um, because as I told you, I was working for the, for the automotive sector. I was working for the automotive sector, and I basically saw the need to, to learn AI myself, and I started from, from the very scratch. Uh, because first, I, I went through the whole process from either uh, st learning with online courses, uh, going into um, a coding bootcamp in which I did full stack, uh, signing up for an AI masters. So at the end, uh, what I can guarantee you is that um, when we're doing this, we're taking into consideration all the different environments or variables that you could, that you could select. Um, okay, so I'm gonna be with this part. So the first thing that I, I wanna share with you in terms of artificial intelligence is that we now use uh, our mobile phone as our brain. It's an access to, to, our, to our brain. We have sort of outsourced some of the computing power that we needed before to gather our friends, our best friends' numbers, or the shortest path to phone. Um, we just use the phone now. And it's better and it's more efficient. You don't remember about something, you set a reminder, and then it reminds you whenever it's time. And that's perfect. Um, but there's some cases in which that is uh, harmful, right? Which is when it's, we let the algorithms decide for us what we want to do. Like, I don't know if you've ever had uh, an experience like navigating or surfing YouTube. Um, but another cool way that you can test this is that actually probably none of you lives home without the phone, right? It feels like something empty. Like it, either you make the conscious decision of living without your phone, or if you get out in the first five steps and you've left it, you come back and you, and you pick it up. <coughs> it's the guy went up, pardon. Um, Not, not the promo is not there, I'm just... Um, so, another thing that has happened um, over the course of the years is that we have the mobile phone or the internet has enabled us to access a huge concentration of knowledge. If you can remember from, I don't know, 20 years ago, um, the whole pitch of the internet was that once everybody is able to tap into the whole knowledge at reach, then instantly we're gonna become more smart, and in some ways we are because we know how to use Google, but um, in reality, um, the problem is that we've also been more vulnerable to distractions like social media and so on. So the pitch here is that in the past, yeah, okay, all the knowledge was in, in monasteries in somewhere in southern France and Italy on books that you had to copy by hand, 
But if you went into one of those monasteries, you really, really um, had the ability to focus onto that. So, another thing um, about the algorithms is that if you are using them to surf YouTube, then okay, it's perfectly fine. Um, but actually, there's other implications, like on self-driving cars, in which it can be good or it can be bad, right? And the, the metric of this is like, if it's good for me and it saves my life, it's good. And then if I have an accident, it's bad. But the idea is that um, the whole, my whole interest for artificial intelligence is basically being able to know the algorithms that are ruling about ourselves and potentially to code it and to fix it and to improve, right? Um, so for artificial intelligence, um, the whole notion of artificial intelligence is that it is the science of computing that enables computers, machines, to think and learn like humans, right? To basically replicate the same sort of behaviors that we do. And you can think about it as like, if the traditional algorithm for computing, it's sort of like a cooking recipe, uh, um, to say, okay, if this, then that, if you have apples, then try to do an apple pie. Um, the whole premise of, of artificial intelligence is that it's a smart cook, you know? Like, if you're a human and you open your fridge and you see that you only have eggs, you're like, Mm, okay, scrambled egg time, and you realize that, that that's a decision that you have to make. So you can access all the different recipes that you have in your head without having to carry a whole book of those recipes beforehand and having to manually um, search them. And um, for this, um, maybe I can do an, an experiment with all of you now. And okay, so hopefully it's the first time that you've ever seen this. And I'm, I'm going to tell you it's a uh, kurdim, right? So sit well. You you can memorize the shapes. Um, so. Which one is it? The ones that thinks A, nobody thinks it's A, B, C, okay, we got a majority for C. Um, so you guessed it right, but actually I tricked you, right? Because, so, so let's, go, let's go one thing on, on this and that. So first thing, um, we changed the color of the, of the handle because it's, it's, dark, it's whiter. We've changed the, the size of the grass, we've changed the color of that, we've changed the brand, we've changed the orientation, we've changed the background, and you still were able to, to guess it right. And, and I, I lied to you because this is not the Kurdim, right? Kurdim is just a short name that I put for a course of dimensionality, um, which is a, a, something that happens on, on, on deep learning. Um, but this is actually called a, a shingle foe, and I, I had to Google this term too. It's basically used to splitting wood once you've hit it with, with the ax, right? Um, so, Interestingly, um, you've been able to behave um, like a neural network, right? And um, this is the premise of how these things work. Like, they don't necessarily have to know and understand the person that they're seeing is called Marcos, but they know that it has the features on something that they have seen before, and then they're able to, to guess it correctly. So um, the whole premise as well is that in the same way that you right now are taking the inputs and deciding whether uh, you should listen to me or if you are at risk because I make this flat, and you associate that to danger, um, the neural network um, goes to a similar behavior. So it mirrors sort of the same processes on, on, the, on the neurons or the activations that we have in our brain that make us do decisions like lift or not the muscle, right? So in your, in your own brain, you have a neuron that is a receptor, which is the dendrite, that de then has an internal nucleus of processing, and actually through electrical current, which is uh, quite exciting. And then um, through that internal nucleus, it decides which neurons it should trigger in response. So it sends a response to up to 7,000 neurons which it's connected to, and then um, those send another response and another response, and then you decide if you lift your hand or not, right? And the, the most interesting thing here is that this is super similar to the way an artificial neural network uh, works, right? So you have, if you can chain several neuron activations together, we get a similar structure of how an artificial neural network works, but you have an input, you have some hidden layers, and all you care about is that your input is that you're seeing an object coming to you, which is this one, and your output is that my hand's gonna catch it because otherwise I'm gonna look super clumsy, right? Um, so that's sort of like, it's interesting that we don't know what happens inside our brains. Like it's, it's such a human mystery that we, we are able to send a man to the moon and we still cannot figure out um, why we think the way we think, right? And hopefully um, that's gonna be one of the greatest um, research uh, in the recent years. Um, so the way you could think about it for an artificial neural network is that if you see, if you feed the neural network um, a set of images of dogs and cats, 
and, and it memorizes their features, it looks for, for the size of their ears, for, for the size of their nose, for the way they have their skin, the particular background in which they're in. And then once you fit it, maybe um, a pug, a carino, which is a dog with a very squished face, um, it, it may have never seen that dog uh, before, but maybe it knows that it's super similar to the French Bulldog, so then it will tell you, okay, I predict that this is more similar to the French Bulldog than all the other breeds of dogs and cats that I've seen before, so I'm gonna tell you that it's, it's a dog, even if it doesn't fully understand the concept of what being a dog is, right? And if you want it in a more simple, but also more mathematical way of explaining, um, the way you process the images, and for the sake of the demonstration, let's just do black and white, because then otherwise we would get different channels. If you see a number, um, you clearly know that this is an eight, but the computer doesn't, right? And the way the computer processes this eight is it does a matrix of 28 times 28, which is the size of the pixels, with all the activations of the matrix, right? And here a zero is a complete darkness, and 255 is complete uh, white, right? So it has the activations and the patterns, and what we can do with this is we can say, okay, instead of going through a matrix, just process all of this in one single line, all of the whole uh, 784, and you can't do the 28 by 28 multiplication by hand yet, um, into a into network and um, process uh, what are those activations, right? And the cool thing about this is that basically there's some hidden processing which it learns to identify the features <coughs> of the numbers, like that an eight, has, an eight has like two circular shapes, so maybe it confuses a, an eight with a nine because the nine has one circular on top and then one thing on the bottom, or an eight with a six because it has a circular on top and an arrow over there. And then it's able to predict which class it is. So you can see here like the fuzziness of how it is changing uh, as we are transitioning from one number um, to the other until the probability just overtakes. And another interesting thing here is that one of the biggest problems that we have uh, today is again when we let algorithms um, take control of ourselves. Like for example, if you are sourcing, surfing YouTube, and okay, your, your ideal or your initial goal uh, may have been to go to YouTube to learn. Uh, in my case, let's say I wanna learn about artificial intelligence. And that's my goal, and I, I don't know, I subscribe to all the YouTube channels that do artificial intelligence, and I follow them. And the problem that this has is that the incentives of my algorithm for learning are not aligned with the incentives of YouTube's algorithm for charging me money or for making money out of my viewership, right? Um, so in, I don't know, after I've seen three videos on artificial intelligence, YouTube detects that knows from my previous history that I have a uh, likelihood of watching videos of cats dancing, and then it shows me um, a video of a cat dancing, and sure, I'm at home, I'm bored, um, <laughs> would I rather watch the video of the cat dancing than Nueva Sesión del Congreso, or um, another video on AI. And I may click on the video of the cat dancing. And this is sort of how the wheel starts because I don't know if you've noticed maybe how you surf um, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. We're just scrolling down the newsfeed. We're not making decisions of like, I wanna see this person. We're just, show me what you got next for the algorithm and based on that I'll make my decision. And the algorithm whole goal is to make you stay in that platform um, the, 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 uh, the most time possible. And I have a personal experience, which of course I cannot validate, um, uh, but whatever. But like when I'm on Instagram, I always think, so when I start watching stories, the story that you quit, the next story that they're showing you is super interesting. It's from a person that you care. Um, that in my case, it's like my cousin or some really close friend that I'm related. And I'm like, that's nuts. If they figure this out, you know, like they're really trying to make me stay more time in the platform. So the whole idea here is that algorithms are powerful but they're also powerful working against you. So you wanna be aware of that, you wanna block that. There's some apps like you can block the newsfeed from Facebook, you can um, delete Instagram, which I did for a year, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so okay, you may say, oh, okay, what if this algorithm shows me a cat video for five minutes more? And it doesn't matter, right? Yeah, sure, for a cat video it doesn't matter, but if you're driving and it doesn't notice you because you're black, then that does matter, it does matter quite a bit. Um, I would want the engineers of whichever self-driving car company to ensure me that I'm not gonna die because my particular profile is not uh, correctly detected on the, on the dog web, right? And that's one particular example, but you can also think about um, how, I don't know, if you're doing an interview uh, for, let's say, a particular company, in this case, Amazon, which is a real case, um, it, it feeds on the data, the algorithm, the AI algorithm, gets the data of all the previous other successful candidates that later became Amazon employees and decides, okay, this is how I'm gonna select. And you can see the problem that you may have there 
and is that, uh, well, most Amazon employees are men or engineers because either you're in the warehouse carrying hard work or you're an engineer, which is traditionally a male-dominated field. So therefore, the algorithm starts saying, okay, as a woman, you are not a suitable candidate. And the reality is that here, it's just replicating the biases on past data, right? Um, so the, the whole problem that we want to solve is uh, here is that if you are a person, right, you can always go to the other person and be like, I don't care that, I don't know, you have a particular bias against me. I just want to show you that I'm worth it. And then the other person can change their mind. Algorithms sort of make their decision and you don't even get to see it. You just get an email and it's like, sorry, your application has not been accepted. Thank you very much. Bye. Right? So um, the two things that I want to highlight here is, first of all, um, a single thought, which is, interestingly enough, um, we're able to uphold the algorithms to better standards to which we uphold ourselves. Like if you think about it, um, if I go to an interview for, I'm gonna use Marcos because he has a company and he could hire me one day. I go to Kepler and I pitch in my profile and Marcos can say, I don't like the guys um, that wear glasses because I was bullied by a guy in glasses when I was five and I just hate them and I will never hire them in my company. He'll never tell me that. So the interesting thing is that he will just thank me and I'll go home and I will not know why I messed up in the interview. The cool thing of algorithms is that you can actually try to go there and look why they're doing what they're doing, right? So the whole premise of this is that um, um, yes, they do make mistakes, yes, there is bias, but hopefully there's a time in which we're able to explain that bias and we're able to compensate for that, right? And here it's another example. Um, if you're from one particular class, you can see, clearly see that from this, let's say, distribution of data, there should be two classes, right? But if my algorithm only makes one, and then you can see that there are some people that are left behind. And, and our whole idea with what we want to get in, in, in Academy is that um, we, we allow for diversity to incorporate that, right? So we want, we want the robustness in the algorithms, which is one side of machine learning that's called explainability in AI, which basically um, tries to um, get algorithms to explain why they're doing what they're doing. But the whole other premise is to get more diversity on the field of artificial intelligence, right? So if you think about it, everyone or the majority of people that are in artificial intelligence um, are predominantly male, predominantly white, predominantly from the United States or from a good computer science school that had a bet for artificial intelligence early on. And those people are the ones that are deciding on, I don't know, if they should um, uh, put uh, uh, more people in jail uh, given their behavior, right? And again, jail is another example in the United States. If you're black, 20% of the male population is in jail, uh, probably because of police bias. Um, so therefore, um, that would only replicate the same type of behavior, right? So our whole idea is that um, we want to get, um, this is the explainability on AI that I was mentioning, um, but our whole idea is that we want to get a diverse set of people in AI, and this means not only getting engineers, but getting doctors to learn AI so they can bring it back and apply it to their field, um, that we can get physicians, that we can get people that are 50 years old, that we can get people 20 years old, that we can get men, women, and so on and so forth, right? And the whole idea of this is that if you are able to spot a bias as you're working as an AI engineer, you will care about that bias and you will make sure that that gets fixed. And then therefore, the combination of several people from several fields pushing for their own perspectives to be solved um, will enable for a final solution that is more robust, that is accommodating for, let's say, a bigger representation of what humanity is. And these are um, some of the types of diversity that we're trying to incorporate. But if I can, you can see the Vikings, I put this, uh, we have a, a Svanquit, which is an Icelandic girl, and I made a, a good uh, set of uh, jokes in the, in the boot camp, because in Iceland, they, they bake uh, uh, bread with ash from the volcanoes, right? And they just bury the bread in the, in the ground, and then the ground is super hot, so it, it, it creates the bread, so we, we made this joke consistently. Um, if I can also pitch you what got me particularly interested on artificial intelligence, it's probably this algorithm for, from DeepMind. And this is not um, deep learning, this is reinforcement from learning, but the whole idea of this is that they were able to get a humanoid um, or, or a stick with legs with no idea of what walking was. And the only thing that they rewarded it or him or her was uh, an incentive for going more far. And you can see that it sort of replicates the human way that we have of walking, right? So for me, when I saw this, I sort of thought like, if, if an AI in a few uh, training, uh, let's say days or years, has been able to figure out or to replicate one of the most special things that make us human, if you think about like maybe monkeys are the only other bipeds or ostriches, 
um, how long is it gonna take for it to replicate um, other things that we now think that are exclusively from humans, right? Um, there's another uh, interesting set of movies, if you've never watched her or Ex Machina, they also play with the idea of robots having emotions and being able to trigger emotions into human beings, and it's quite an interesting read. And uh, the whole reason, or uh, the whole point why people are using AI in a variety of fields is because it not only is able to match or uh, work in the same way as humans do, but actually is able to overcome them and succeed in serious things such as cancer detection, right? So in this case, um, there, there was a set of, of, of scientists from Stanford University that got together a team of expert dermatologists and got them to compete with artificial intelligence uh, to see who was able to better detect skin cancer. And uh, AI bet them from, so AI got 82% accuracy and human dermatologists got 63%. And the reason behind this is that um, human dermatologists are the main experts in their field, but I think in my, in my way, if you wanna think about the romantic explanation, is that as a human, as a human dermatologist, you get tired, you come to work and you have a bad day. Um, there's a day that you slept three hours and you still have to diagnose the same performance. And it, the, the really good and bad thing of AI is that it doesn't forget and it doesn't forgive, right? It, if it gets to an accuracy, it always does that every single time. So it's sort of like a machine. So the idea of here is of course not to take over human doctors, but actually to be able to um, enable them to better detect cancers in repetitive manual tasks that they have to do over and over again. Um, okay, so I hope I have given you um, uh, an introduction to, to artificial intelligence. Um, uh, there's, there is one quote um, from Stephen Hawking that, that passed away that also really inspired me and I want to share with you, um, which is that humanity is either gonna be the best or worst thing, uh, sorry, artificial intelligence is either gonna be the best or worst thing that happens to humanity, right? And, and with that call to action, um, I wanna ask you what are you gonna do about it, right? And I don't expect you to give me an answer right away. Um, that's fine. Um, but I can give you also my own personal answer. I can share a bit of you of my, my story of how I transitioned for a man with a suit or how other people call you a consultant into um, a, a guy that gets to wear sweatshirts and goes hackathons, which in other words, it's a developer, right? And so I want to share some of my hidden layers of hidden outputs. And these are, hopefully, the, the idea of why I put this, these extra slides together is that if you come today and you don't know AI and you don't want to do this bootcamp and uh, you're not even interested in what I'm pitching, then these tips, I hope, are going to apply to you or are going to help you in some way, uh, no matter what you do in life. So it's a very generic advice, but I can tell you that through this transformation, um, two years, this transformative two years that I've had, uh, they've really helped me a lot. And um, I hope that if I was able to convince you of one thing, is that AI is actually going to have an impact, a real impact in our society. So. It's good to be a chameleon and to adapt to that, to that transformation, right? Um, so the first thing is, um, uh, it really pays off to follow um, your passion. I think you're gonna, really gonna see it from, from the projects of our fellows, um, but when, you, when you're really excited about working on a particular problem, it, work doesn't feel like work, right? And then that's just a magical thing because uh, then you can outbeat any single person that is your competitor because that person is like, ah, I have to do two hours more, and you're like, yeah, I get to do two hours more, right? Um, so that's one thing, but then uh, on the other sense, um, I feel that the world is more increasingly interconnected, right? So it's not like you just have to do your thing and say, okay, I'm a doctor, I only care about medicine, I ignore everything else, right? We're, we're seeing in a lot of, um, let's say, ways, uh, examples of how a T-shape, which if you, if you want me to pitch you the T-shape, it's sort of like Elon Musk, which is a physicist and has a background in physics and it's very good in <laughs> other fields like, I don't know, autonomous cars, um, <laughs> Um, the boring company, the, uh, driving tunnels, space, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but the idea here is that you can go deep into a field, but you still should stay open to all the other opportunities that are near you. Because if you think about innovation, um, there's two types of innovation, right? There's the exponential innovation, where you just come out with something radically new. We can think about, I don't know, the nuclear bomb. And there is this type of innovation that is more incremental, that is normally 99% of innovation, which is we think about something else that we've seen in a field, let's say biology, and we say, okay, can we make a giant metal plane fly like a bird? And then suddenly we have birds flying, um, or planes flying um, actually faster than birds, right? And if you think about it, it was inconceivable for the people that, of our time, uh, of our contemporary time, in the 1800s, um, to actually uh, think that something that had a bigger density than birds, um, or than air, 
you know, could fly. Uh, that's a quote by Lord Kelvin, which we do owe him um, some of the things, such as a uh, uh, temperature uh, system. Um, another thing is that I really, really had no idea how to code in the beginning. And you may think, OK, Jan, you were an industrial engineer, so you sort of had the mentality and mindset, uh, so you were able to do this. Uh, well, yes and no. I think that uh, what matters the most is the attitude that you put onto it. Um, I, hopefully, there are some people in the way that are willing to believe on your motivation, and not necessarily on the set of skills that you have today, but on the set of skills that you can acquire tomorrow. And if I can give you a short pitch, um, when I was in, in San Francisco, I had, I had the luck to, to go for a scholarship there to do a, an innovation project in, in Silicon Valley. And I it sort of, they, they said that it was the last year that the marathon was going over the Golden Bridge because of terrorist um, concerns, right? And this had been like a long-term dream of mine, but like a 40-year-old, I wanna one day run over the Golden Gate Bridge across a marathon goal. And then I was like, okay, your world's getting crazy. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and train, right? Um, so I did one mistake, which I have to apologize to my girlfriend um, that is here, which is um, I signed up for a marathon and I only had one month. So both my girlfriend and my mom were extremely pissed at me. Um, they called me all sorts of things to try to sort of get me to quit um, training for the marathon. Um, I'm not gonna say hopefully I didn't listen to them because I have to say 99% of the times they're right. Um, but in that case, I was just um, super, super stubborn with completing this, right? So what I did was like, I got their concerns, I reached out to doctors, I figured out with some friends of mine, which was like a reasonable training plan that I could do to actually finish the marathon. I didn't want to do like a two hours, I just wanted to like finish it in any human way possible. And, and I was able to do it, right? And you're like, oh, okay, but you're a runner. And uh, actually, that month that I had decided to run had been two years since I had not run because of, of a previous injury before. So um, just to give you another pitch uh, on, on, on different skills. Um, Another thing uh, that you're gonna see is that one, one of the things that matters the most, in my opinion, is the ability to work in silence. So when I, was, when I, when I decided to do a bootcamp um, last summer, which was on, on full stack development, I remember I, I shut down my whole social media, I told all my friends, I'm gonna, I'm gonna suck in meeting with you, I'm just gonna be the worst human ever, but then in September, I promise you that, that I'm gonna make it right, right? And the idea behind this is that nowadays, we increasingly have more and more distractions. If you think about it, um, we, we maybe on the next bootcamp we'll implement like a no phone policy, right? But if you think about it, when you're trying to learn, there's so many things that are calling your attention. Your phone's vibrating, your, your friend WhatsApp you, uh, somebody goes on Instagram, if you don't reply to a WhatsApp in one day, uh, nowadays um, it's, it's, it's like super rude um, because you, you're expected to give like an upfront communication. So something that I did last year and I actually carried to this year is I have all the notifications of my phone disabled, which means sometimes I'm a bit bad to answer. Um, and then uh, I have, uh, yeah, my phone is on gray, uh, grayscale. Uh, I have, well, the Instagram is erased. And I'm trying to, to do all sorts of tricks to sort of not allow myself to fall into the daily patterns that these algorithms are trying to, to set my time on for ads. Um, another thing, uh, I think that if you're trying to do something alone, um, it's probably not bold enough. You, you want to do it with a team. And the reason for this is that if you're doing it with a team, you're able to sort of get the best people in the field and you, you get to work with each other and you get to create something that goes beyond that, right? There's no company that was raised by, by a single man or woman. And the idea here is that you have to sort of be able to not micromanage, to just know what your strengths are. And here I can pitch you that I suck at marketing and I'm really, really thankful for having Stefan to do this. And partially the reason that we got so many people of you today. Um, and yeah, uh, the idea is no matter if you're trying to learn AI, if you're trying to learn cooking, um, it's so much more fun when you're doing it in a group. And last but not least, this is my favorite quote or thing. And I say it over, uh, the guys from the bootcamp um, know it because I'm like, okay, we have to stay until now. I don't, I don't get anywhere to stay late, but sometimes we do because we're fixing problems and we're fixing bugs. And I'm more than happy to, to stay extra time. But the idea here is that you want to be perseverant, right? And you want to be perseverant for the single reason that we are, we are 6 billion people on Earth, uh, close to be 7 billion. And it's so unlikely that out of those 7 billion, there's not a single person with the same aspirations and goals that you have, that we can almost say that for sure there is someone that has those very same career goals and that you have, that has the same set of skills and that is equally prepared, right? So my pitch here is that um, what I try to do on a daily day is to try to work as hard as possible so that I can sort of reduce the 
variability or the lag factor of that person getting the thing that they want or me getting what I want, right? Um, so the whole idea here is that if you work hard and uh, sometimes people are, are tired of, of telling you no and they just uh, let you do what you want yourself. Um, so thank you and I hope that you have enjoyed this presentation. I promise that the next ones are gonna be shorter. Uh, I don't know if you know this movie, but it's uh, Space Odyssey. Uh, it's a famous quote from How. Uh, if you're ready for the demos, I don't know if you wanna take like a five break, you wanna breathe, or you wanna go straight into the demos? Break, demos? Demos, okay, demos are good. So let's do that, and let's welcome um, the first demo which they have to set up, which is Edgar and Eva. Um, that are gonna shine us with a face logger. And now we have to give us one minute to change the computers. So we're gonna put Eva's computer here and you don't need an HDMI, right? Okay. I think the break might happen still no matter what. that this is a project but also this is something that I have installed in my home and it's like a prototype that in the future, in the near future you can buy and you can plug in on your domotic house. Our project is called AI Face Loader <coughs> and we are going to talk like five minutes. <laughs> Hello, my name is Eva. I'm actually studying electronic and automatic engineering here at the UPC and I will start the third year. And I'm Edgar Pons. I founded uh, some years ago Social Coin, that was a company that was pre-selected uh, in Y Combinator. I worked three years in uh, pro producing robots and electronics, and now I founded a company called NanoBoost, and it's about biohacking. And if you want, I can talk later. So the objective: imagine that you install this little product in 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 your house, in the door. And it has a little camera and a processor that is a little computer, it's a Raspberry. And the Raspberry has two functions. First, uh, detect who is entering. And then uh, it has inside a little domotic system that controls the lights, the volume, the speakers, all, all your house. So uh, the, the camera send the image to the Raspi. We build a model uh, to detect who is entering there. Uh, now can detect if Eva enters, me or another person. And if Eva enters at home, uh, the Google Home say, hello, Eva, I'm gonna put your music and I change your lights, uh, whatever Eva wants. And if a, non, if a unknown guy enters, a thief or something, or someone, <laughs> uh, the, the system sends a notification to your Telegram with a picture of a face of this guy. And maybe call the police and all that stuff. So. Okay, so what we have been doing those weeks, first of all, we needed to choose what was the best model. So we set uh, like five models and we compared them. First of all, we trained all of them, but the biggest problem was that some models couldn't be trained in our computers. In a laptop can be done, so we needed a bigger computer with that needs more efficiency. So once that we test all the models, we choose the best ones. That was the second part. And then uh, we needed to set up the Raspberry Pi. The, it didn't have anything, so we needed to install all the, all the um, program. There was really challenging. We needed to spend like two days doing that. It seems really long just for installing it, but 
it was really, really difficult. Later, we needed to set up the Google Home and join everything, so now at the end, we have the product. Yeah, and we train all these models to recognize the images. So we tried CNN, Transfer Learning, or Yolo, Hard Cascades. Sounds weird, but we are going to explain all these models now. OK, first of all, CNN, a convolutional neural network works like that. First, you put pictures, some pictures of Edgar, some pictures of mine. Then it applies some filter. The point here is that, a, that it's a neural network. That means that you don't say what are the difference between Edgar and me. For example, you could say Edgar has blue eyes, Edgar has brown. No. This works like you put the machine, the pictures of both, and it is the neural network that chooses the characteristics and the difference between us. So at the end, you have Eva, Edgar, and if the probability isn't as higher for both of us, it's like a known person. So, but <coughs> how we train that? To train that, we isn't just needed two pictures. We need a lot of them. So at the end, we ended like 14,000 of images in between both. So how we did really 14,000 images? No, we did a little less. So what we did was some pictures, and we used a, a technique called image augmentation that from one picture you can take another four. So as you can see from the original image, we can do two, two rotated, one that was mirror, and the other one you can see it, but in fact has some noise. So at the end, is isn't the same image for the neural network. Another idea is transfer learning. It's the same idea as the neural network, but instead of doing from scratch, as we did in the uh, before model, here um, we have some part that is a ray train. What, why that is good? It's good because, as I said, with these computers, you, can, you need a really powerful computer. So in this way, we can train the model with our computer. The only thing that we change is the last layer. After this, we have ORB that is a um, it's a system that detects uh, key points, uh, random key points, for example, edges or something, and then you pass an image, and it tries to find the, the image with a similar key point. So it's fast, but it's, it's not accurate. So then we have YOLO, that is a pre-trained mm, pre system that detects concepts like person, laptops, bottles, caps, or chairs, but doesn't detect uh, specific people. After this, we have hard cascades that is a super cool system that it's super fast and detects faces, uh, eyes, mouses, and things like that. And, and it gives you the information of the, the, the points. For example, it gives these points and these points. And then we can take uh, these points to, well, you, you will see now. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so at the end, what model we, did we choose? All of them have had some good points and other bad ones. So at the end, what we chose was um, one hard cascade and CNN. CNN, we chose it because it was really reliable, fast, and was accurate. But the problem that it had, it was only able to take one person or one object in the picture. So how we solve it? We, ha we solve with hard cascades that can detect multiple persons in the same picture, but it's not personalized. So we need CNN. Yeah, and we, what we did was this. So if you pass this image to the CNN, it only can detect one person. So what we do is, uh, with hard cascades, we crop the image um, from the points that it, that it the, the red point and the uh, pink points, and we send it to the CNN. And this, is, and this part takes the, the position, and the CNN takes, identifies the person. So. Now we have <laughs> the, the <laughs> demo that it detects 100% Edgar, and after that, 100% Eva. Yeah. And you can see it can detect uh, both at the same time. And now we have the model for the thief. Jan <laughs> <laughs> is our thief. And this is the telegram at the same time. Bam, it detects a thief. And you receive the notification of, of Shan entering at your home, stealing <laughs> your code. And now we are going to try to do a live demo. This is the <laughs> hardest part <laughs> because you never know. You never know.
l'has passat? Sí. Sí? Daniel Ran? Ah, no, no li has fet Ran. The code is running. Ja l'ajudo. And we have here also a home assistant. Home assistant connected. Restart, restart. <laughs> enter again, enter again, enter again. Hello, Edgar. You and Marcos at 35%. Enter again. Be more Eva. <laughs> now. So what we did was basically to say, if there are 12 frames from the video that appear as Eva, you can say it's Eva, because it can hide you. But otherwise, it doesn't say anything. Here the fact that that was because of the lights and the light now doesn't, we haven't trained it in, the, in those conditions. But naturally, the, the fact is that put in this case, how we would solve it is put the threshold higher. So in this case, we needed to be more and more sure that it's Eva. But that's some point that we need to train and test. Yeah. That's the point. Um, and that's all. <laughs> I think now you are sharing. Yeah. Está duplicada. Está. Tienes duplicado el ordenador. Tengo que quedarla con el. So we've demoed this several times, but you know what happens when you're doing it live? That something decides to restructure again. So we're gonna fix it. This is a good moment for it to fix. Yeah. Yeah. Shut down. Turn off. What should you like, Sandra? Do we go? No. Yeah. Fix it. Perfect. Okay, thank you, Jan, for the introduction. Um, hello, welcome. I'm going to talk to you about procurement analysis. Procurement is the purchases of the government. As Jan says, please don't, don't give your hopes. Trust, trust us. <laughs> um, first of all, well, Marcus and I am from Latin America, and in our countries we have like a lot of issues about uh, corruption, about bravery, and about these types of payments that are not um, properly. Let's think about building a hospital, building a road, or bridges. There's, there's a lot of money there. So there's like an incentive there to pay to, to our governors. So that's a huge uh, problem. Actually, in Mexico, 51% of the people says that they, that they have uh, paid 
for their services to the public um, employee. So that's a huge thing. And in Costa Rica, it's 24%. So that's a lot of people paying uh, rigorous just to have this, their services. So we were talking about this. In Peru, we have Fujimori case, uh, all the bridge, all these things. And OK, how we can fight corruption in our different uh, countries. And well, in my country, we have data. So <laughs> we work with, with this. First of all, um, well, my name is Anna. This is my group. As you can see here, I have three dogs. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and okay. I don't know why. Okay, okay. Let's move this. Okay. This is my crew. I have three dogs. They helped me to code this this project. And I'm from Costa Rica. This is a small country here in Central America. So as you can see, I'm far away from home, and I came here just to take this boot camp, and it has been a great experience. My name is Marcos. I am a medical engineer, and I'm going. I'm going to study this, this year a uh, master in computational biomedical engineer, and I'm from Peru. Okay, as I well, as I told you, procurement or government purchases as are a huge deal. In my country, it represents 15 percent of GDP. That's a lot of, of money. So we're working with a real life um, data set, and this this data set represents this number is hard to say, hard, hard to understand, but it's a thousand six hundred millions of euros just for a period of five years. So that's like a, a lot of money. Just think about how much it, it is, and um, it's 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 a good um, well, it's a lot of, of money. I work with the Supreme Audit Institution in Costa Rica, and it's similar to Tribunal de Cuentas in here in Spain. But um, the, the name is CGR, and we have the access to, to this data. So that's a good thing for us. For our data, we have this structure, as you can see here. This is the description of the product that we have in. As I told you, this is the purchases that the government does. They in buildings, they in computers, they in chairs, they in pencils. So in here we have the service of like the things that you're going to eat today, but the description is coffee, soda, for for uh, for 45 people. So that's a lot of, of work, and we try to work with this. But we also have this. It's called Supartida. That is like a big bag of products. So we can put all of this in this big bag and work with with this one. So in this case, we have 18 different categories, but we have a, an issue. They're all words, or mostly of those are words. When you work with machine learning, you need like a, a bunch of numbers just to the machine machine learns because with words it's quite difficult. So that's the first problem that, that we have. Um, second of all, this type of categories, we have thirteen thousand different types of products. So that's a lot of different types of products. And we work with sixty one uh, institutions. So that's a hard thing to do, but then told us that you have one week and a half. So how we managed to do this, we select only five institutions, but this top five institution has the highest amount of money of purchases, so we have 80% of the cost. So that's a good way to work, and then when we have more time, work with the other institutions, and we only work uh, with the subpartida, that's the big bags of products. So that's the only thing, and we select the top five. So what we did, we create three tools. First, we don't know what was in this um, data set. It's a huge data set, and we're just starting to work with this uh, system of procurement or government purchases. So we create analysis. Also, we have a very basic uh, website, so we create plots. Uh, to improve this website. And finally, we create anomaly detection algorithm. As I told you before, we have a big problem with uh, corruption. So we, if we can find patterns in the purchases and the contracts to find anomalies or fraud, or potentially fraud, that would be a very useful tool for us to detect this, uh, these things. For the data analysis, <coughs> well, we find some insights. We, we obtain that it doesn't matter the institution that we choose. They don't know what, what are they going to buy the next year. 
each year, each year is different, different amount of, of purchases, different uh, quantity of contracts. So that's something that we have to work on. Also, we found that the, the process is quite easy. So that's a good thing. The contracts are quite easy to, to work with. And finally, a huge problem is that most of the contracts are direct. So I can, uh, as an institution, I can buy from you, from you, from you, and there's no no obligation to have like a proper process. So I can buy things from my cousin or for a friend or for someone I, I know. That's a huge, a huge uh, point in, in this analysis. Then, as you can see here, this is a web page. It's not very user friendly and it's you select the year, and then it gives you the list of all the contracts for that year, and you select then the institution, and it just shows you the money. So it's it's not very, very uh, interesting as a citizen. So we create these plots. As you can see here, we have the subpartida there, and then you can see who's the supplier, how much uh, money the government is spending with the supplier, how many contracts they have, and um, so it's, it's quite interesting for the citizens to uh, check this. And also we did it with the supplier. So we have the name of the supplier, how many contracts, how much uh, they sell, and, and, and for what institution they, they, they bring this. And well, now we're going to talk about the anomaly detection, and my friend Marcos is going to explain what we did. So our data set uh, has like uh, no labels, which means that we don't know if some data is like fraud or not. Or so what we had to do was uh, find a way to, to figure out this. So we took four different models for algorithms that help us uh, detect the different uh, outliers or, or strange behaviors that you can find in our, in our data. And on top of that, we use also this model, which is DBSCAN, and we and I will explain this one by one. Uh, the first one is called one class SVN, which is a, sub, uh, uh, a model that uh, tries to separate your data uh, using a, a plane. Uh, depending on your on the on the shape of your data, you will need to use the, like these kind of tricks that are just mapping your data in order to be able to to separate them using this this plane. Uh, here we can see another different model that is called uh, Robus Covariance. And we can see that it's trying to make uh, an envelope that uh, shapes your data. But in this case, we can see that empirical covariance is being biased by, by this supplier over here, whilst the Robus Covariance is doing a pretty good job. And also the, the OCSVM, which is the previous model, also is doing a good job doing uh, this separation of the data. Uh, here we have an isolation forest, which is a model that is trying to separate your data uh, in different uh, steps, and uh, the more steps that it requires to, to isolate a data, uh, uh, it will give you a different, a different anomaly score, and depending on this score, it, it, it fits a higher score, it will be like a normal data, but if it's a uh, lower score, it will give you like uh, an outlier. Um, the last one is the local outlier factor, which is basically looking at the density of your data. And it will be doing a cluster or a group of your different data, data points. And based on the density, it will uh, tag the different points as layers or as a normal data. Here we have a, a comparison of the different output that we can obtain with, with these models. The first one, as you can see, is, is a, an elliptical envelope that is doing a fair job with the outliers. Uh, and the two ones, one class SVM and isolation forest is also doing a good job, but it's also doing like a step forward, which is mimicking the the behavior of your data. And finally, the local outlier factor has no envelope, but is doing a job of classification, which is 
something that we really need. And so what we found of this, with, this, with these models, so what we did was just to take all the models and make them both, which means that they are giving us uh, the, uh, the confidence they have that one point is a liar or is a normal, a normal point, well, normal data. Uh, so depending on the of the confidence that our models have, if they will be, they will plot the different data points uh, of different uh, colors. So the the darker the the points, the more confident our models will be. So as you can see, there are different outliers that our models found and. Arrest the, that they didn't, didn't find uh, as an anomaly, as an anomaly. We can see that the score is plot on the y-axis, and the, and the price that of the products is on the x-axis, which is in Costa Rica and currency. Uh, and also, in order to detect the anomalies, you have to to insert a, a threshold, which is based on the percentage of of data points that you expect to be an outlier. In our case, we set this threshold at 0.1% of, of, the, of the data, which gave us uh, this, this kind of distribution. And finally, on top of that, we, we run a DB scan plus optics uh, model, which is basically, basically doing the clustering uh, based on the, on the density of the different, different uh, groups that we can find. So don't be scared of this plot because it can be easily explained. So we have different thresholds. We will be talking about this this one. So whatever lies on the top of the of this threshold will be set as will be flagged as an outlier and whatever goes below this threshold will be used as a as a cluster. So we can see that it found two two clusters and one set of outliers. And you can see here the result. And in more explained way, we can see that it found different uh, clusters, normal ones, uh, big ones, and finally the outliers. As you can see here, well, we found five different ways to detect anomalies, to detect potentially uh, fraud. So that's a good thing. So if you're a supplier of the government, watch out. And uh, in here, actually, these are big contracts. We have two main uh, roads uh, construction uh, constructors. And actually, it's like the case here with Grupo ACS of Florentino Flo uh, Flores and uh, Nunes and Navarro. So that kind of collusion, collusion, but we've never been able to properly show it like this way. So we have the idea, but we, we wouldn't be able to, to show it like this. And I'm, go I'm not going to say the names just for <laughs> security things, but this is like a real, like a real thing and a real um, output. From the Costa Rican guy here knows which ones are. So, um, as I told you before, we want to work with the real product. We work with a back of product, so we have the maintenance of roads, we have the roads, we have the machines just in one back. But we will, we will try to work with, with um, just one product. So we, we try natural language processing. Natural language processing is like uh, is a um, way to use machine learning to work with words. So when you go to translate a text or know the, the importance of a sentence in a, in a text, this is what you use. But first, we didn't have this data time. Second of all, as you can see, it's not organize the, the information is all in capitals, doesn't have the signs, doesn't have like like much um, things to, to use for, so probably in the future we're going to work with this. And for, finally, the important lesson here is that we can find a way to detect fraud, to detect um, something that is not uh, well behaving in our purchases of, of the government, and we use AI. So. If we, if we need to look for this, as a human being, it will take hours and hours and hours just to look, just to find one. Check contracts, check um, a lot of information. With this, we can find four contracts. So if we have to check into the, I don't know, we have um, more than a million of rows here. So if we have to check each one of those contracts, it will be 
extremely difficult, but with this, it's a really way, it's a really easy way to find like those that are not well behaved and work on those and then detect potential problems. So thank you for your attention. If something doesn't work, something that we've seen over the bootcamp, they can install and install an Anaconda, start a new environment, so they can also install and install the TV. And, ah, it's the Raspberry. What? Ah, okay. Ah, but I guess I can be a lot of people. I'm going to be presenting on detecting drowsy eyes in real time, and I named my project City Eyes. So, my name is Wendy. I'm a final year student at the University of Ghana. I'm pursuing a major degree in actual science and a minor in computer science. For those of you that don't know what actual science is, it's basically statistics that's uh, more specialized in, uh, in insurance, sort of, but it can be applied in almost every other financial or any other institution. So I'm a software engineer and a photographer, and I co-founded and had an all-girls team, coding team, that encourages women basically to bridge the gap in STEM, especially in Africa. So, right. So for the average human being, uh, we require like seven to 10 hours of sleep. That's for like an adult between a teenager and an adult. But if we're being like real with ourselves, when was the last time any of us had like eight hours of sleep? So statistically, uh, what you actually need and the ideal people that sleep that amount of hours is like 72% to 21. And if you lack sleep, I mean, it causes things like unproductivity <coughs> and what I am focusing on for my projects, which is collisions that are caused by drowsy driving. So, in the US alone, there's like 83.6 million people that's dry sleep deprived. And it causes about 21% of all their fatal accidents. And that's about 3 to 28,000 crashes alone. And that's just in the US. So, what I thought of is if I can detect somebody that's drowsy while they're sleeping. And I thought of three simple steps that I can do this. That is, first of all, I detect the face of the person, and then I focus on the facial landmarks of the person. When I say facial landmarks, I mean like your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your ears. But then in this case, I focus on your eye, and then I apply an algorithm called the eye aspect ratio algorithm. 
um, and then I classify. So to be able to detect your face, I had like three options: Hacker Skate, histogram oriented <coughs> gradients with um, linear support vector machines, and then deep learning based detectors. And when I compared the three of them, I realized that well, Hacker Skates are very fast. But um, the accuracy is like not very much. It's lesser compared to the other models because sometimes it can detect something as a face that's actually not a face. And for the histogram and linear support vector machines, I realized that it has more accuracy well, compared to like the hacker skate, but it's slower to detect the face of a person. And the deep learning based detectors was like an ideal choice because it's more accurate, it's more robust, but it's computationally expensive. And depending on the depth and complexity of your model, it can be extremely slow. Well, depending on what I wanted to do and the fact that you know it's somebody that's moving and driving, I decided to go with hacker skates because it's like fast and it can detect the thing like the face very fast. So I detected the face, and for me, one major concern was I wear glasses. So what if I'm driving it? I mean, I need my glasses to drive. So will it be able to do that for me? And I tried it, it worked fine without my glasses and with my glasses on. And then the next thing was, will it be able to detect the facial landmarks if I'm still wearing my glasses? And I tried that as well, and I think it did it quite well. And then the last thing I had to do was to apply the eye aspect ratio algorithm. So, uh, you can forget the math that's going on down there, but basically what this does is to compute a ratio of the upper lid of your eye to the lower lid of your eye, and then it will compare it to like a threshold, like a given number. So if your eyes are open, it's like one or a hundred percent, but if it's closed, it's zero. So you take like a threshold and you say if it's below this, it means that the person's eyes are closing, and um, if it's not, it means the eyes are open. So that's what I did. Uh, I'm going to attempt a live demo for you, but before I do that, well, my, my computer is like extremely slow. So before I do that whilst I'm running it, let me just run you quickly through what I did. So basically I'm capturing the subject, processing it through my webcam, and then I, I extract like the frame. So when I extract the frame, I'm going to like find the landmarks, which I already explained, that's like of your face. And then I focus on your eye because that's what I want. So I do that and then I compute the eye aspect ratio algorithm and I compare it to a threshold giving, in this case I use 0 0.25 and then I take a decision. So when I was doing this presentation, uh, someone asked me, so what happens if I blink? I mean, if I blink, it means that my eyes are going to go below the threshold. But this is considered because um, in this instance, it records for consecutive frames. So if your eyes, your eyes have to be shut for like some seconds before it's going to do that. Just in case my demo doesn't work, I have a video recording of it. So this detects my face. And then I'm going to try closing my eyes. You are in the front of. Oh. No, it's okay. Does it work? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to try closing my eyes for some seconds. Hopefully it works. It's supposed to produce a sound. I don't know. Because I can see what I'm doing. So. You want me to try? Uh, I can't see what I'm doing. <laughs> but. Uh, so it's supposed to. I hope I'm running the right so. Yes. Like I have one eye open, I don't know if that's why, but I I don't know. Well, it, it it has to be closed for some time, but yes. So I, I anticipated this work, so I have like a video of it. 
working. But one major problem that I faced was because my computer is like really slow, so it records like the frames and then it takes a little while for it to process because so it gives a sound because my eyes are shut and then it gives me an alert on my screen. Yes, so basically that's that's how it's supposed to work. Now uh Whilst I was doing this, just as you realize, when I changed the lighting, I re it's, it, it found it difficult to work. So I'm like, what happens if I'm driving in the night? And, you know, there's no light. And, well, thanks to Apple's new algorithm that was like launched like two, three years ago, I see that, I mean, the feature is bright and there's more machine learning algorithms that are coming up to be able to detect like low light um, features then I wouldn't have the problem I just had here. And then possibly an integration with like a mobile app and to alert maybe your wife, your mother, that you're driving and you're drowsy, so they should probably give you a call and then you would stop. So thank you and... <laughs>
typical echo between two computers. That's a typical mic off and listen. Meow, 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 meow. That's that. No, 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 because you're. You have this. Ah, I think I can do it. Give us one second. We're gonna uh, just uh, stop your audio. Okay. Ah, oh, no, no. Para que ahora escuchemos el seu audio rapatín y a vosotros tenemos amplificado. Espera. Espera, eh. One second. Still figuring out the resisting. It's like. At the end, maybe we're going to have to resort to the most basic human thing. Can we clone the phone and the micro from this side? You hear us? What, what? It's like a Sudoku. <laughs> no? If you close the micro now. Okay. You can start. Start. Share. Share screen whenever you want to, and then you can start. Let's do one thing. Um, leave the room. We're all gonna leave the room, and then we're gonna enter again. Vale, surtim tots i la truco. Sorry, this is uh, the complexity of the loop. So give me one tiny second. Um, again, we plan for the logistics, but sometimes they fail. So hopefully, we still have phone numbers to save the day, and I promise you that it's gonna be worth it. Estancat, has sortit tu del room també? No. Surt del room i tornem a fer-ho i ja està. I que surti ella. Sorry. Hello? Hello? Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, so, yeah. I think we can hear you now. So, yeah. you could start the presentation and hopefully there is no lag and we don't have those groups. Yep. You ready? Great. Okay. I will start now. Okay. <laughs> speakers and we need to keep up with the technology we want 
or language to survive. But now let's look at the project. So first we need to ask, what is a named entity? And a named entity is basically just a fancy word for a name. Uh, it's any named object that appears in a text, and it can be like a person name or a company name, place name. There are many categories available, and there are also some numerical units. So named entity recognition, on the other hand, is like finding and categorizing these entities, so these names, when they appear in a text. And this is an elementary tool in natural language processing, NLP. And it falls under the extraction, where we take raw text and we extract some information from it. And this way we can take unstructured data and turn it into structured data. And this is uh, an important point, because there is an unbelievable amount of unstructured data, textual data, in the world. Just think about all the stuff that everyone writes on the internet every single day. And all the books in the world and uh, all the text that we have online lying around. So we need some methods to, of turning this data into valuable data that has some meaning to us. In that. And information extraction is one of these methods. So here is a simple pipeline of named entity recognition, where we take some text, like the rain in Spain, as raw input, and then we apply some pre-processing, like tokenization. And we might also want to know the word class of each word, like whether it's a noun or a verb. Um, well, then we get to the fun part. Let me put the pointer on. So that's this part, where we extract information from the text, which in our case consists of finding all the names. We then output the tag text, which can be used to solve other NLP tasks, such as machine translation, speech recognition, text summary session, to name a few. But now we can look at a bigger example. Here we have some text. You might know some of these names. But a computer doesn't. It only sees strings of characters. But when we have a named entity recognizer, we can do this. So here we have extracted all the places, companies, and person names, and even some dates and thereby turning the unstructured piece of text into structured text that we are now able to process further. So this may not look like a difficult task, but it has indeed proven very hard to solve over the years. It's not as easy as looking at just whether a word is capitalized or not. I wish it were. But if you think about it, it is the nature of names that new ones appear every day uh, because everyone wants to be special and stand out, so they create unique names for their companies, their products, even their children, etc. Also, the same named entity can belong in many categories, like this Icelandic name, Hakla, which can be both a volcano or a person name, or even a car dealership. And also, Icelanders love to create new words even when other languages have perfectly good words for the same thing. So in Iceland, Batman is little blue in my name. Sometimes when we're naming things, it may look like uh, a cat walks over the keyboard, <laughs> like in the case of AFL language. But this is our language, and we love it for what it is. So, uh, because Icelandic, is a very complex language grammatically. We have up to 60 variations for each noun, and we have over 100 variations for verbs and adjectives. So therefore, it's not enough to just look at all the words in the list. There's simply too many of them. We need other methods. As an example, just for young, here is the infamous volcano Eyjafjallajökull. language. The name has these four variations which can all appear in text. So we need a way of finding them all. Whether it is Eyjafjallajökull, 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 Eyjafjallajökull. So this is what I'm proposing. This is what I'm doing for my master's project and as part of this bootcamp final project. The end goal is to create the first machine learning named entity recognition for Icelandic. 
it will be, be composed of three language models that will be combined to choose the best classification for every word. We already have a prototype of the first model. It is a bi-directional LSTM recurrent neural network. That's a lot of words, but you may have seen some of them. The results were very promising. We had an F score of over 80%, which in the world of named entity recognition is quite good for a prototype. The second one is still being worked on in my team. And the third one, finally, is the one that I'm doing for this project. It is based on a language model called BERT. So BERT stands for Bidirectional Encoder Representations from Transformer, Transformers. And it's built using transformers, which are a type of neural network. I really don't have time to go into how they work here, but there are some excellent papers on the issue that I recommend. BERT is a revolutionary language model from the Google research team, which has given new state-of-the-art results in 11 different NLP tasks. And the arrival of BERT has actually been described as the Alex moment for natural language processing. Alex Knight, as some of you know, is a neural network that revolutionized deep learning back in 2012. But why all this hype with BERT? Well, one of the strengths of BERT, it lies in the fact that it can be adapted to so many tasks using transfer learning. This means that first, it has been trained on massive amounts of text, which is this semi-supervised step on the left. And then it can be fine-tuned using only a small amount of labeled supervised text data. This means that we can use the power of this huge model on the left to solve a task where we have much less data available. But for me, for this project, there is a catch because this model does not exist for Icelandic. There is an English one, and a Chinese one, and a multilingual one. But we would need to train the Icelandic one from scratch. And then we need at least a billion words. And this is not something we can wake up in an afternoon. Because training bird for a new language takes a long time and is very expensive. And I've seen numbers up to $50,000 for just one training session of birth. And you can't use a normal computer running on a CPU. It will just crash before you know it, I think. And on a GPU, which is a much more powerful processing unit, it is possible, but it will take you months to train. But now that I've kind of decided it is my goal to train an Icelandic bird model, I applied for this program at Google where you can get free credits to use their own really powerful processing unit called a TPU. And I got the 30 days to try it out. And so I'll see, like I've seen very different numbers of how long training will take, but I think a week. But this is something I need to plan carefully. I need to, need to make sure everything is configured correctly before I start training. And apart from the training time, there is another catch. We need labeled data for Icelandic named entity recognition. So, before I started this project, this kind of data didn't exist, so we had to create it. So we took a collection of one million words and then started work on labeling all the named entities in the text. By now, I have labeled 200,000 words, so there is a lot left. But I'm using automatic methods to help me, like long lists of names and regular expressions, as well as a lot of time and patience, of course. But in the meantime, I can work with the 200,000 words I've already typed, which is what I've done for this project. Since I don't have an Icelandic birth model, I used the multilingual one, which is trained on 100 languages, including a little bit of Icelandic. These are the first results of my prototype of a named entity recognized model using BERT and by Icelandic data. So what we see down here is an F score of 46%, which is of course quite low if we want to go up to 100, but we need to keep in mind that 
This model is trained mostly on other languages than Icelandic, so it has hardly seen any of the Icelandic names that appear in the text. So, uh, as we can see, like in this column, the precision is quite good, with up to 80% precision for person names, but then again, the recall is low, so it's missing a lot of words. And that's probably because there are so many words that the model has never seen. And here, for comparison, here are the results of the LSTM recurrent neural network that we trained before on the same data. Uh, and we, you see we have, here we have 81% of score and up to 93% in the person names, which is the easiest category to still. We, like, I think when we have a functioning BERT model for Icelandic, we would be able to reach these numbers or even surpass them. Uh, we could read more into these results, but this is just the first attempt, and the project is far from over. So the next steps are training BERT on Iceland. But for this, I need a bigger virtual machine with more memory, and then I need to make sure everything is working before I start training and hope for the best. So, to sum it up, I think the value of this project lies in its benefit for Icelandic language users because an identity recognizer is one of the necessary resources when de developing other NLP tools. And it means there is less manual data analysis for a lot of companies. And last but not least, both the labeled corpus that I'm working on and the Icelandic BERT model will also benefit other Icelandic NLP researchers who can use them to solve their own tasks. So, this has been a challenging and a very interesting project that I'm excited to continue with in the next months. And this is a project that stands close to my heart and it is, as it is part of making sure that future generations will continue communicating in Icelandic in the digital era. So thank you so much. Thank you for listening. So much. Um, we're transitioning to uh, Nicolas now. Um, I'll give you a call later. It was awesome. Thank you. I hope you were able to hear us. Can you put your off? Oh, vale, comencem amb el doble. Espera, espera. <laughs> Fes a sortir al room. Okay. Yeah. Did you accept me in the room? Uh, Edgar, ha fet un knock. El pots acceptar el... Um, what's your phone? It looks like you. Yeah. Okay, so the one last project before the awesome come on and fries with the dinas. Um, I'm sure you're yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Them, so, but, so. Uh, again, Shared entire screen, yeah. Uh, you have to click, yeah. Team, so we've said the last of your. I don't know about this, but. Um, and then I'm really forward to the chatting with others. Figuring out. Help you in, in any possible way. Um, if you want to ask any questions, because I'm allowed to have questions, basically, I'll have time for questions. There's people that have children, I'll have to back home by a reasonable bedtime. Um, figure that this would work for all of you. So, you're not sharing. No? no. But I, I shared everything. In the period? What's, what's share screen? Share screen. Share screen. Share screen. Your entire screen. Share. You're not, you, because you click stop sharing. No, I didn't. Close. Close this message. message. Oh, okay. And hide. Uh, hide, hide, hide. Now. Uh, Perfect. Okay, so with no further ado, please give a round of applause. Okay. Nicola, um, moving to renewable energy is a very difficult problem. And <coughs> one of the ways to do that, or one of the things to help us, is machine learning. And in a paper that came out this year, authored by Andrew Ng and 96 other leading researchers in the field, they identified forecasting as being one of the major contributing factors to moving to a fully renewable grid. 
Um, and so this sort of inspired me to try and do a project here on short-term energy demand forecasting. Um, so my name is Nicholas. I'm originally from Canada where I did an engineering degree. I went to the Netherlands. I there studied energy. I've been living in Spain here for the last several years and I'm part of the, the National Curling Program both as a coach and as a, as a player. So what is short-term energy demand forecasting? Um, in this definition, we're doing the 24-hour ahead load um, demand forecast. So we're trying to say, okay, from now, what's the next 24 hours going to look like? And so this sort of looks like this, where you see the orange lines are the forecast, and the purple lines are what's actually happening. Um, and, and why do we care about this? Um, because if we can do a better 24-hour demand forecast, then we can also plan for high load days, we can plan for low load days, and we can generally manage the resources of the grid better, uh, leading to more renewable generation and, and a more efficient grid overall. Um, and why do I care about it? Well, forecasting, which is the, the, the practice of using past data to predict future data, is uh, it's considered a difficult learning problem, and I thought it was, it was up for a challenge. Um, and also because I think it's highly relevant to problems related to climate change and what's happening with uh, renewable energy today. Um, so how did I get started with this problem? Uh, basically, I went to the literature and I looked at what was being done and I found this paper and they were using several different types of neural networks to do a 24-hour short, a short-term low demand forecast. Um, and they came with an average error of about 1 to 3%. Um, and then I found another paper which said, well, maybe you don't want to use a uh, neural network because it takes about two to three times the amount of computation power to get the same kind of result as a classical statistical model. So I decided to investigate both, uh, to, to implement both models and see how we do. Um, so let's look at what's an energy demand forecast. So here you have the average uh, energy demands over a 24 hour period, over a couple of years. And maybe we're using more energy, but what I want you to take away from this is that the energy fluctuates throughout the day. The amount that we use fluctuates throughout the day, and sometimes by quite a bit. And if we drill down and go into the individual years, you can see that through different months, we change the amount that we consume by quite a lot. And sometimes even the shape changes. You can see here you have like two peaks, and then sometimes it's, there's no two peaks. So this is all something that has to be taken into account when we go to forecast. Um, so what do we use to make forecasts? Well, we make forecasts with models, which are essentially algorithms. And I decided to implement three models. The ESRIMA, which is a classical statistical model. PROFIT, which is um, Facebook's version of old classical model, but new, sexy, and fast. And the LSTM, which is a type of neural network. And what did I put into these models? I put in previous energy data, time of day, uh, day of the week, weather features, and holiday features. Um, OK, so that's ESRIMA. It's super complex, but you don't need to worry about that because if you look at the, the individual parameters, you can get a feeling for what it's doing. The first three parameters are basically saying, what's the trend? Are we moving up? Are we moving down? Are we moving sideways? And the second feature is seasonality. So do we see a recurring feature? Do we see that every third day it seems doing the same thing or every, every month it's doing the same thing? And it tries to model the trend in terms of these different seasonal features. And then you have uh, profit, which is a, it's known as a general additive model. Um, and so this is basically Facebook implementing a, a, a really fast version of a classical statistical problem in a different, in a reformulation. And so I've seen it being used all over the place in capacity planning, anomaly detection, different types of real business problems. Um, and it basically works by saying, okay, can I fit a Fourier transform to the day and then to the week? and then to the month, and then to the year, and I'm going to add them all together, and I'm going to do that every time I, I try to make a prediction and come up with a function. So here you can see we're adding together uh, different sine waves, and we end up with a square wave there. And then the last network was a neural network. Um, so I'm going to do a really quick crash course in neural networks. Uh, so this is a classical neural network, or a deep neural network. And basically what I want you to take away from this is that you get a string of input, and you get a single value output in this network and it's good at memorizing uh, patterns. Um, but what it's not good at doing is finding relationships between the inputs. So in order to do that, we use a recurrent neural network where we take the output and we put it as one of the inputs and so that it's every time we're getting an output, it's saying, okay, I know something else is happening here and I'm able to find relationship between the, between the samples. Um, but it's not so good at finding long-term dependencies. So if there's something that happened 100 cycles ago, maybe you can't remember it so well. 
So that's where we've introduced this long short-term memory where inside each neuron, there's a set of logic gates that have the ability to say, should I remember this or should I not remember this? And if I remember this, is it something I want to apply to this particular sample? Um, okay, so how do we implement these models? What's the general procedure for implementing the model in, in time series? Uh, basically what we do is we take the data and we chunk it out and we start from an early set in the data and we say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna train the model and then we're gonna test the model on a, a subsequent set. Um, and this is really, really relevant to 24-hour to load forecasting because if we think about it today, we have the information for right now and we don't know the next 24 hours. So we can use the information we have right now and in the past to forecast the next 24 hours and move to the next step. And we do that a couple times and at each step we average how wrong we are and that gives us an indication of how well the model is working. So this is the first result that I came up with the SRIMA. Um, so you have the blue is the, is the prediction and the orange is the actual, uh, actual value. Um, and you can see that it takes on the shape of the day fairly well, but it doesn't account for interday variability. You can see on the third day, it, it, the actual dropped down and the, the model didn't really account for that. Um, and the other thing was that trying to model this on large amounts of data became difficult because uh, SRIMA is implemented in stats models, and stats models doesn't work with GPUs. So I had to use it on a CPU, and trying to do this, it, you know, it took a long time. So I decided, okay, what am I gonna do about this? Well, I'm gonna go to Google, and I'm gonna get a really powerful computer. I'm gonna get 64 cores, tons of memory, and that's gonna be awesome, but don't try to do it with your free credits, because they won't let you. So then I went to Profit, and I, and I said, okay, this is supposed to be a faster implementation of a similar model, uh, how well can we do with this? And the results are pretty good. Uh, you can actually see that it fits the, the individual days, but it also fits over a cycle of a week or more, um, taking into account that on weekends, for example, we use less energy. And then in the last model, I just want to take a side and talk a little bit about the structure of what I did, because in the previous models, we were always taking in long strings of data and then we're putting another string of data. And typically with an LSTM, uh, with this type of neural network, you would do the same thing. But the original paper that I found, they suggested that the relationship between these time steps is stronger if you were to go the, the sort of, for example, right now it's eight o'clock, so eight o'clock yesterday has a stronger relationship than eight o'clock with seven o'clock, for example. So we had, so I decided to restructure the data, and so here this would be like, one original model, and then we, we break it out and we make one model for every hour of the day. So you have 24 models. But this would be pretty computationally intensive, so the solution is to take the, the past time steps and the features and to flatten them into one vector. So you can see that's the flattening process here. And when you do that, you end up with one hour for each, uh, sorry, one feature and past time step vector for each uh, hour of the day. And, and you combine them together. So here you have all the information about that individual hour, all the hours, and then all the samples that we're gonna run over. And it gives you an output, which is just a column vector and a, and a single number for the uh, individual hour of the day. So when I did that, it actually turned out pretty well. Um, so this is the result, one of the results from the, the long short-term memory. And you can see that it fits the day pretty well. It also fits the individual weeks and the days in the week. But it also, if you look here, and we're going to compare the models here in the next slide, uh, you see that in this model, it actually, the next day, went up higher, but it, it, didn't, it didn't predict that based on this, this, this movement higher here. But here we were able to do that. Um, and I thought that was pretty cool because the model really had learned something about the data. So here, are the, this, these are the errors from, my, from the models I produced. Um, the best model I produced had a mean absolute percent error of about 6%. Um, and if you compare that to Spain's current forecasting error, that's, well, not that good because theirs is about one to 2%. Um, but I wanna put this in perspective. Mine was three and a half percent, or three and a half times worse. Uh, but this is a two week project with a 2012 laptop and that's going against a team of experts and their supercomputers uh, with years of experience doing this. So um, I'm pretty happy with my result. I think uh, if, you, if I have four GPUs and uh, a year to work on this problem, I'm 100% certain that I could get the same amount. Of, uh, of error. So thank you very much. And so that's it. The last, the only final.
final thing that we have to do um, before we get into any working and chatting is um, taking a picture with other fellows. Nice. We're gonna give you the certificates that you're later gonna sign. So if you, you pitch today, you can be on stage and then we'll pull the imaginary one for this banquet. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for coming. I know it's late. Um, some of you have families, have commitments. Um, I hope that this presentation and some presentations were impressive and appealing enough. Uh, we hope to do this um, several times. Um, please come on the stage uh, because you're, you're the ones that put some work today. So hold on, now I have to scramble for certificates.